Good morning, everyone. Um, I am happy to be with Judge Kelly and Judge Rick today for uh, the, the panel number one, April 2024 case call. That's about all I know in terms of the introduction part. As far as uh, housekeeping matters, uh, I know I can't say let's hurry it up so that everybody gets to the golf course on time for their tee off so i have to come up with something but i hadn't thought about it yet so i'm going to just go through the boring please just get to your primary issues the one you think are the most important for purposes of argument doesn't mean that you choose it out of all the ones you've got in your brief uh and i'll say it again uh we know these cases inside and out and um you can save yourself time and, and be uh, courteous to the people behind you and keep our attention where it needs to be. And that's the best way to do it. So we'd appreciate if you just, I always say, tell us why you win uh, with variations. And that's sort of where I come from. I know everybody has a different style. So let's begin with uh, case number 362-031, People versus Lester Jennings Bush. Okay. All right. Uh, we, um, Mr. Simon is endorsed, he's not here, but uh, we will submit that on briefs. Uh, case number 359640, People versus Brandon Tate. Two months in a row after a long spell. Nice to see you. Good morning, Lee Somerville, P41168. I represent Brandon Tate. Um, this is a, his appeal from his jury trial, and we've raised a number of issues. Um, you know, the concern I have is the second phone. Okay. Now, if that was error not to admit that, what would that fall under, the Brady argument, or would that fall under the ineffective assistance counsel argument? I've had a hard time separating those two issues because it's all about the phone records. Yeah. Mr. Glenn could not provide me with phone records and testified at trial, I mean, not at trial, excuse me, at the Ginther, that he never received them. And um, so I thought it was either him for not pursuing them or the prosecutor for not giving them. And I've been working with the prosecutor's office for months trying to get them. And all I could get was that um, exhibit. They didn't have any, and, and Mr. Tibbs was not a person that I knew or was dealing with at all. When I met he's him, he's off the hook. Is he's that what you're saying? Yes, he he did give me the phone records um, after the first hearing on my post judgment motion, which is a little late to be getting them. And after you know my um, expert had looked at everything and had sent me around to take pictures of all the the uh, towers and stuff. Um, but I, I do think that that is, it's not completely exculpatory evidence, but it is somewhat exculpatory it is evidence. Somewhat. It shows, it doesn't show him moving from where he said he spent the night. So it would be under the Brady analysis then, right? Not the ineffective assistance? Unless they gave him, unless they gave it to Mr. Glenn and somehow it disappeared. But I also called Mr. Glenn's brother to testify because the affidavit yeah. says that, you know, he gave it to, to the, the brother. Because they're both lawyers. I can see that happening. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, the funny thing is, is that um, I forget which one of the Mr. Glenn's testified that you don't get this kind of information from the prosecutor's office unless you bring them uh, those drive. little things you, you plug in. UBS Flash drives. drive. Flash yeah. Drives. And actually, I had to bring one down from Mr. Tibbs to give me the information that he did, you know, a couple of days after our first motion hearing. You know, so I think that certainly lends credibility to um, the Glenn's assessment of the situation that they never got it. Um, Mr. Deer, I think his name was, said he was going to do, going to give it to Luther Glenn, but it, it never happened. Um, so I, I think it's Brady. 
But if they did give it, it's it's ineffective assistance. Right. So and and I just don't think that um, identity was proven um, at the trial. The um, the guy who said he saw the person who was in a fight with Red by the car also said he didn't see the fight. Um, he's also shown not being by the car when he said he was by the car. He was only by the car after the um, victim was killed and somebody else came to rob him and gave uh, the witness the marijuana. So okay. um, that was probably the primary concern is the issue that, that was, I know I had. Too. That was the only thing I had other than that. Well, I just wasn't. I'll, Reserve a minute for rebuttal. If you yeah. don't have Sounds questions. good. No, I mean, Deirdre. I have okay. no questions. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, Mitch. Good morning. Just for the people. Um, so I do just want to clarify all of the phone records that we had in our possession were turned over to appellate counsel. Um, nothing was withheld that we had. I believe the second phone, when I looked into it, was never dumped. That I don't think they could get into it. So there was no data from that phone. Um, and defendant at all times had maintained that he had both phones with him. So any cell data from one phone would be, by his own admission, consistent with this. I also would like to clarify the timeline because I don't think that the phone data was exculpatory at all. The last call before the murder is at 1.33 a.m. At 1.49 a.m., you see who uh, the jury determined was defendant pull into the driveway next to his home. At 3.11 a.m., the killing occurs. At 3.14 a.m., he's seen leaving that home. And then the next call is at 3.38 a.m. I don't have the maps with me, but I believe the ones that were admitted at the Ginther hearing was it's about an eight-minute drive yeah, from it was the, the tower that he his phone was pinging from to where we see him going back to his house. So the, the timeline is all consistent with him making a call, driving to his home, committing the killing, leaving, and then making another call. Okay. So it's it's not actually a scope for it. Right. Otherwise, any questions? Good briefs. They explain themselves pretty well, so I'm good on it. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, your parents, and we will submit that and have something out to you soon. Thank you very much. Uh, so, well, let me get it. We won't go into the show. Okay, so let's begin. Let's begin this next one. Three five nine eight six one. People versus Adam Callow. Mr. Roach is endorsed. Uh, let's see, remote, remote request granted for Mr. Roach. Uh, anybody in the gallery? There he is. There we go. Okay. Can you hear us okay? I can, Your Honor. Good morning. Thank you. Morning. Uh, good morning, guys. John Roach appearing on behalf of Mr. Callow. Um, I believe I'm unopposed today. Uh, and I thank the court again for allowing me to appear via Zoom. Um, Your Honor, this is a one-issue brief on, we argue, the 200-month uh, minimum sentence that was a maximum guideline sentence here is both disproportionate and unreasonable. I am certain this court is probably sick of posy arguments at this point, so I'm not going to make one. I'll just rely on the brief that I presented to the court on the one issue, and uh, I'll take any questions that the panel might have this morning. If we had a point system, you'd have scored a bunch of them there, but we don't, So, but thank I you. I appreciate that, Judge Kavanaugh. All right, we're all set. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Have a great day. Have a good day yourself. That case will be submitted. Uh, case number 360109, People versus William Stanson. Good morning, Your Honors. Kirsten Nunn on behalf of Mr. Stanton from the State Appellate Defender's Office. Yes. Um, I'd like to reserve uh, these three minutes from my time for rebuttal if it comes to that. But the way things are going, I'm, that may not be necessary. Up to you. So um, my colleague, well, former colleague, who is now your colleague, raised a number of issues in this brief, but I intended to only just focus on issues two and four, although I'm happy to answer any questions that the panel might have about any of these. Why should you prevail on those? I'll get right to it. So on issue two, which has to deal with the improper testimony given by the um, the prosecution's expert, uh, Ms. Rosperski, I believe her name was, the forensic examiner. 
we should prevail on that because her testimony amounted to, as we are going to briefly amount to improper vouching. She didn't just merely explain what a forensic um, exam does and what the purposes of that um, examination is. She then went on to say, and I quote, that 90% of um, kids are sexually touched by someone they know and love. So based off of that, and additionally, she also went on to say that nine out of 10 children are sexual assault victims. So take her statements collectively. A jury could have inferred from that, that the complainant was you know, essentially telling the truth, even though she didn't actually say those exact words, it had the implicit effect of basically essentially vouching for it for all intents and purposes. As um, it speaks to issue four, um, it was kind of a two-part issue on the sentencing issue. I believe that people agree with us that the trial court did not do a fine job of articulating why they imposed that consecutive sentence. So I'm not going to get into that. Just briefly on the other part of that um, issue, we do feel that the judge pretty much arbitrarily included an additional factor in his um, sentencing decision that is not included in the snow factors. And that was the factor of victim closure. He specifically said when he was giving his sentencing that um, I'll add a six one today victim closure when he was listing all of his considerations for this such as that he was going to impose. Didn't though the trial court also acknowledge the four factors and said he was going to be sentencing based upon those. I mean, I, I appreciate the commentary, um, uh, arguably if, if he were actually relying upon, you know, victim closure. But I mean, isn't there a difference between just acknowledging that this will bring the victim closure, but here are the factors. I, I, I'm just not as persuaded, but maybe I'm missing something. I oh, agree. I mean, it, the way that it, he listed the factors and we are acknowledging that he didn't just say victim closure and kind of leave it at that. But he said the purpose of this sentence is punishment, protection, the community, deterrence, reformation, restitution, and I'll add a six months a day. So it is our argument that he did actually approach that in there and include that as an actual factor as this consideration that this is one of the things that I am also including in that. And we just don't feel that victim closure is an appropriate factor. Good morning. May it please the court, Aaron Mead representing the people in this case. Uh, I will address the two issues that uh, uh, council has, has raised. There's also one issue that I have not yet had a chance to respond to because it was only raised in the reply brief. So I'll touch on that briefly, um, unless you tell me not to. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of issue two, which is the uh, interviewer's testimony, uh, it's, as I said in my brief, it simply takes uh, her statement out of context to suggest that she was saying that 90% of all kids, period, um, are sexually touched by someone they know and love. Uh, that, that, I'm sure that would have shocked everybody if it had been. Uh, I mean, is that really, I mean, that's a statistic. I mean, why is that? Well, and, it, it, and the, the construction the defense has now tried to put on that statistic is that she well, was we, saying we, that, yeah, we, we sort of get it. Okay, we know yeah, how much I, focus I, to put I, on I it. I figured we get it. it. Let's hope so. Okay. Yeah, she was saying, you know, in, in the cases where it happens 90% of the time. All right, all people. right. And that's a reason for delayed disclosure, which is permissible under Peterson. I mean, you get to explain that so the juries don't understand why kids don't run immediately report it the way that an adult might. So I, I think that was fairly, fairly clear. Uh, on the fourth issue, the sentencing, uh, we agree that the court didn't sufficiently articulate reasons for consecutive sentencing. And uh, the remedy for that is not resentencing, but a chance to fully articulate under Norfleet. In terms of what the court that, said- May I ask, um, and I, I admit I didn't really think about this issue until this morning, um, but it, if, it, if it does not require a full resentencing, does it require a pronouncement in open court or would it be sufficient to have the court articulate its rationale in written format? You know, that's an interesting question. I don't know that I've ever seen that come up as a litigated issue. Um, I'm glad to as, know I, as I a, didn't as an boldly appellate, ask a question about a settled area of law that I had missed. So <laughs> as an appellate prosecutor who likes to be very cautious, my instinct is by all means, let's get the parties okay. together and let it work. Okay. That way nobody can second guess it on, on the ground that he didn't uh, have his right to be present you know, and so on. 
uh, even if they want to. Charge group, yeah. Yeah, if they want to. Victims' rights also would have assuming they've been invoked to apply so yes that, right. yes okay. and I, I think council should have a chance to address it um you know if we're going to go back and rearticulate and argue for why they should or shouldn't be considered so it's, might as well do it up so um but in terms of the courts saying that uh you know the the, the sentencing in terms of victim closure i think the court was simply pointing out that that was going to serve a purpose for kg who Let's face it, if there was, I mean, snow allows for protection of society. If there's one person in society who really needed protecting, it was this one. Uh, because she uh, was still in the middle of suicidal ideation and PTSD and dissociation and all sorts of things. She's been severely traumatized. Um, it's, it, I think it is appropriate, not as a fifth snow factor. I, I, don't, I really, despite what, he, despite what he said, I don't think he was intending to add to the jurisprudence of the state. Uh, by making that a factor. I think he was simply saying, this is something that I hope is gonna bring some healing to you. So I, I, don't, I don't think that's a really a, that he didn't understand the proper purposes of sentencing. That brings me to the one issue that I haven't had a chance to direct, address directly because it wasn't raised until the defendant's reply brief. Uh, in the original brief, defense basically just uh, challenged the constitutionality of Watkins. That's a, this is issue three. And, uh, you know, of course, I answered that, said, look, um, a, a, a fight for a different day, basically, either a, a conflict panel or an appeal to the Supreme Court, but Watkins is binding. Uh, on the reply brief, uh, defense kind of switched gears to a straight 403 analysis. It says, look, suppose Watkins does apply, and I actually, of course, it does, evidence can still be excluded under 403. And so the defense raised some reasons why they thought that was the case. And I just wanted a chance to articulate, since it was a reply brief, um, to point out that it was that other, those other acts, the stuff that happened at the Halloween party, first of all, that led to KG disclosing. Uh, if you look at transcript one, page 160, I think it is, she says, you know, to her mother, something like the Halloween party has happened before. And that's when all the stuff started coming out so there's there's that connection uh, but also one of the claims that defense makes is well this is unfair propensity evidence well what Watkins plainly says is that propensity under 768.27a is supposed to weigh on the probative side of the scale so if if she's right if uh, defense counsel's right and it's uh, propensity that's just fine under uh, 27a um the Watkin factors that they did note that can uh, lead to exclusion under 403 were things like, uh, for example, what was the temporal proximity of those acts? Well, that favors admission. I think it was happening right in the middle of what was happening. Uh, whether those other acts were infrequent, they weren't. They, a lot of them happened just that one night. Whether there were intervening acts, there weren't. Is there lack of reliability of the evidence of other acts? No, not particularly. There's a number of witnesses that testified for these things. Uh, dissimilarity, you know. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> I just wanted to because this this wasn't brought up before. I know, and that's part of the problem too. Is that we're, we're trying to track that, and we don't have I mean, keep it, having you talk about it rather than see it in writing is a little bit different. So sure, I understand that. Uh, we but can figure it out. Though. Absolutely, I, hope. I appreciate it. In that case, unless the court has any questions about anything. Thank you. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. We have about an hour and a half for a rebuttal. <laughs> it's nice we'll seeing you much. again. I <laughs> don't need that much time. Be, be quick. Um, briefly, just wanted to, um, as it pertains to issue two, um, as counsel, uh, further counsel did point out that she did, you know, perhaps maybe she misspoke and we took it out of context. However, in addition to the percentage testimony that she gave saying that 90% of all children, kids are sexually touched by someone they know and love. She then doubled down on that and said that nine out of 10 children are sexual assault victims, which I don't think that was taken out of context at all. And those statements combined still amounts to improper vouching and absorbing harvesting. And <clears throat> as it pertains to the additional argument that was raised in the reply that Brother Council just touched on right there, again, he is correct. 
it is, it is more on a probative value versus the presidential value that that, that balancing test kind of plays out. And it's our argument that the other acts of evidence that was submitted had a minimal probative value here and was substantially outweighed by unfair prejudice and it confused the issues and presentation of cumulative evidence because we didn't need any more of that. They had already talked about the Halloween party. There were additional other acts that the complainant had already talked about in detail. So overall, there was just cumulative evidence. Thank you very much, Thank both you. of you. Well, the case will be submitted. Okay, uh, 362814, People versus Kalina. All right, good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court, Tim Doman on behalf of Neil Kalina. I don't know that I have a whole lot to add to the briefs this morning. Um, the sentencing issue is conceded by the prosecution, so I won't touch on that unless there are any questions. Uh, as for the remaining two issues, I just want to say very few words about the first issue, and that is the sufficiency of the evidence challenge. Um, I just uh, want to take a few seconds to emphasize the plain language of the statute. Uh, so the subsection of the CSC2 statute that my client was charged under uh, requires the prosecution to show that, quote, the actor is in a position of authority over the victim and the actor used this authority to coerce the victim to submit. So it doesn't say position of authority, period. It doesn't say exploit a position of authority. It has very specific elements of use of authority and coercion, which I think uh, were not present in this case, um, regardless of, of how egregious the court views the, the allegations. So other than that, I'm happy to rest on the briefs and answer any questions. You're appreciated. I don't, I don't have anything. Yeah. Thank you. Jasmine Davis appearing on behalf of the people. Uh, Neil Kalina absolutely used his position of authority to coerce GP into two instances of sexual contact. Um, I just wanna respond briefly to the reply brief where it was said that this court shouldn't consider the pre-offense predatory conduct. That absolutely should be considered. If you look at People versus Reed, this uh, court considered how Reed established a position of trust with the victim, how we lured the victim to a place of isolation, uh, had the victim drinking alcohol. That, that's absolutely why in this case, it's appropriate to consider those kind of things. So this is how Kalina used his position of authority to coerce GP. First of all, he's a 27, 28 year old man and GP is a 12 or 13 year old boy. Under ordinary circumstances, um, with no familiar relationship, it would be very odd for a person of that age to be taking a 12 or 13 year old out. So in this case, because he was GP's priest, he was able to do that without raising any suspicion on the part of GP's parents. Um, he was able to do that because of his position as his priest, take him to the movies. Um, uh, he knew that uh, GP was taught that priests hold the highest authority in this world and are literally the bridge between us and God. Um, Kalina took advantage of that by peer pressuring GP into doing things like using alcohol, cocaine, marijuana. Uh, this court can presume that GP felt that was okay because if Kalina, his priest, is doing it, then GP would feel free to do that. Um, he similarly lured GP to his- and that's covered in your brief. Yes, yes, yes. So, um, I mean, I'm happy to answer any questions on that issue, but it is all covered in the brief. Yeah, and you did a good job. That's why I mentioned Thank, Thank you. No. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Well, well, appreciate thanks. it very much. Thank yep. you. All right. All right. That case Thank will be you. submitted. We appreciate it. Uh, Okay, so we are at uh, 362057, People versus Wells. Good morning, Your Honors. Good morning. I think it's just me today. Um, Garrett Burton, on behalf of uh, Dante Wells from the State Appellate Defender. Uh, Your Honors, as you know, I raised four issues in my brief. I really just want to talk about the sentencing issue and then make one point about the second and third issues. So with regard to the, the Beck issue, as you know, trial court can't rely on acquitted conduct. Trial court did that here. Um, when she said that Mr. Wells showed an intent uh, to distribute, that was the um, charge of which he was acquitted. Um, he was only convicted of simple possession. The element that distinguishes those two things are um, an intent to distribute. And so when the trial court listed all of the indicia and then concluded by saying those indicia showed an intent to distribute. Um, she was relying on acquitted conduct. And she can't um, sort of take that back or wave it away 
in saying that um, she's only sentencing him as someone who possessed methamphetamine. That's what she did. That's what she did. Right. I know. I know that she said. Yeah, I know. And so the point I'm making is that you can't say that. <laughs> no, you can't. You can't say that and then completely insulate yourself from judicial review. Right. So. Oh, no. Well, this is exactly what happened in um, Brown, where the trial court there said that, look, I'm not sentencing you as someone who committed murder, but you did all of these murderous things. And so that's what uh, Judge Mita did. She said, I'm not sentencing you as someone who is simply possessing methamphetamine, or I'm sentencing you as someone who is simply possessing methamphetamine, but you did all of these things that it bins in an intent to distribute, and you did show an intent to distribute. And so by sort of tacking on those magic words at, at the end of um, her sentencing colloquy, what she's doing is, is obviously trying to distance herself from that. But that isn't an enough, Your Honor, because if that were enough, judges could in every instance um, talk about all of this acquitted conduct and then touch this talisman or say these magic words to fully insulate themselves um, from that judicial review. So he's, but he's, He's on parole for drug offenses, right? Uh, I think it's a robbery, actually. For a robbery? Yeah. Okay. Well, the reason I ask about the, the drug offenses, obviously, this was one. And I mean, when we're talking about recovery mm -hmm. and the like, I mean, there is a different dynamic with those litigants. I, mean, I, I think, as I viewed it, I thought the trial court was just trying to be very honest, but also appreciating the, the fact that you're not before me on this, um, on the unacquitted conduct, but she, I mean, isn't it fair for her to comment on that? I mean, it's an honest exchange. I, I just hate to think that we now have to set up an obstacle course with our trial court judges where they cannot have a candid conversation, a meaningful conversation with the person standing in front of them. Sure. And, and your honor, I want to make it clear that that's not what I'm saying. I think the, the trial court can have that sort of candid conversation, but this wasn't that. That's because it, it, from my reading of the transcript, what I see happening is the judge hanging on to those, those things that the prosecutor alleged at the trial. That Mr. Wells was acquitted of. And those are, are swimming around in her mind in such a way that she's basing her sentence on um, that acquitted conduct. And so for that reason, it's an impermissible sentence. Um, moving on to the, the two ineffective assistance of counsel claims, the failure to move to suppress the statement and the um, stipulation to the parole status. And those two uh, claims are intertwined in this way, Your Honors. Uh, Trial counsel proceeded from the idea that he wasn't able to suppress that um, statement that Mr. Wells made to police. He thought that because he thought that Mr. Wells had some sort of diminished expectation of privacy. As you know, that sounds in the Fourth Amendment context. That's not something that um, relates to Mr. Wells' right to be free from self-incrimination. And so that mistake of law informed his decision not to move to suppress the statement. And then when that statement was in evidence, trial counsel said, look, it's here. I might as well stipulate to the parole status so that um, uh, the jury gets the full picture that they can see. Uh, I mean, you covered this in your brief pretty well. Sure, Your Honor. I, I just want to put a finer point on it and say this. Because both of those things proceed from a mistaken uh, understanding of law, it's unreasonable. And as a result, uh, trial counsel was in fact. Thank you. No more. Okay. Thank you. We appreciate it very Great much. Job. Yes, Thank Your Honor. Case will be uh, so, uh, case number 361695, uh, Harold Palka versus AAA Emission. Morning, Your Honors. Morning. Jim, I'm opposed. My, my, Correct here? No. Nope. Plaintiff is not here. Sorry? Plaintiff is not here. Oh, no, he's not. This is between the uh, right. car carriers. <clears throat> Let's go. Um, Judge Kavanaugh is aware that I can be very brief, and I will do that again. Oh. 
On September 10th. Uh, when I see you in the room, I, I hate to even say that. I mean, you could probably recite the house rules better than I can. So thank you. On September 10th, 2020, this court issued an opinion affirming the trial court's ruling that homeowners was the priority no fault insurer for the payment of claimants benefits. On remand, we filed a motion seeking to reduce that to a money judgment of about $740,000, which we had paid that homeowners was liable for. The trial court refused to hear that motion on the ground that it was untimely because the July 29, 19, 2019 order from which homeowners erroneously filed a claim of appeal was a final order, despite the fact that it did not dispose of auto owners' claim for a money judgment. The dispositive issue here is whether an order which does not dispose of all the claims of all the parties is a final order under Michigan law. MCR 2.604A says no. MCR 7.2026A1 says no. Homeowners says yes. So I'm now going to leave it to Mr. Duenas to explain why and I'll reserve the rest of my time for the book. Good morning, Your Honors. Good morning. If it pleases the court, Eric Duenas on behalf of <clears throat> Appellee Homeowners. Uh, why I should prevail, uh, and I'll be short to the point, uh, there is a final order that was entered in this case on July 29, 2019. Uh, this order was agreed to by all the parties. We're, we're not here to talk about the terms of that order. We're not here to debate that order because that order is unambiguous. It says this is a final order and closes the case. And with that order, that order was agreed to by AAA at the time, as agreed to by plaintiff at the time, all parties at the time. And if you look at a couple of situations, you look at um, the response of uh, plaintiff's counsel, the reason why he's not here today is the plaintiff's counsel agrees with me at the time of the hearing when they tried to reopen the case. That's what this is about, reopening a case that was subject to a final order. It's not whether we can't look at the order because they never brought up an argument about the order. They consented to the order back in 2019. So, so the, the um, plaintiff's counsel sa says it succinctly in his statement regarding the order. And he says, the final order is entered on 7-29-2019 will discuss, calculate, and agreed upon by all counsel. Uh, there was no mis error or mistake all, uh, as all counsel intended such orders to be final orders closing the case with appellate rights preserved. So we did that, we entered that, that order, that final order, and we then we proceeded to appeal and AAA was part of the appeal. And in AAA's response, AAA's response indicates that the, um, the appeal discussed the liability and the third party complaint. So how, how can we have not a final order for the third party complaint when that is the subject of the appeal by admission of AAA. So there's no question that there's no ambiguity of the, of the contract of the order. There's no question what it says and what it does. And, and there's no question that the, the trial court was correct in denying the motion to reopen a case three, almost three years afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. I found it astonishing that we can talk about the finality of an order without discussing its content. What is the definition of a final order? Finality of an order is defined by its content. It has to dispose of all the claims of all the parties. The July 29 order did not do so. It was not final. Saying that it is final at the bottom of the page does not make it final. Would I have any questions or no. any doubt on that issue? No. Thank you, Roger. Thank you both. Case will be submitted. Appreciate your appearances and the briefs. Uh, okay, we are at our 11 o'clock call. Um, sometimes people are early. Uh, I, mean, I tell you, I'm going to, well, anybody here in their entirety for the 11 o'clock call? Both sides. Not just here singularly waiting for somebody else, but do we have cases ready to go?
We do. Okay. Shall I guess which ones they are? Or you want to tell me? Okay. Oh, so you're, you're, uh, they're okay. single. single. Okay. Uh, that's good enough to get started. So uh, I, if that's okay with my colleagues. Okay. Uh, so we will begin the 11 o'clock call and most of you were here uh, for the house rules. So we'll pass those, uh, bypass those. Uh, case number 364036, Gregory Reed and Associates versus the estate of Aretha Franklin. Good morning, and may it please the court, Cynthia Filipovich, appearing on behalf of the, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, defendant at Pali, the estate of Aretha Franklin. With me today at council table is uh, Miranda Bolahana. She's an associate at our firm. And while this is not my first time before this honorable court, it is Ms. Bolahana's first time uh, before. My sympathies. <laughs> And um, <clears throat> Judge Kavanaugh, uh, in keeping with your uh, instructions this morning, um, I'd like to be brief and say that we, the court should affirm because the case is moot. I think that's the issue, the primary issue that we, we went on. The court only decides actual cases and controversies. Right. And while this case was brought and while this case was actually brought, you know, decided on summary disposition, a prior case was filed by the plaintiff in, um, in Oakland County Probate Court, which I'm going to call the Franklin Estate Proceeding, a notice of disallowance of the entire claim was served on the plaintiff on November 27th, 2018, under MCL 700.3804. The plaintiff had 63 days to challenge that disallowance. The disallowance is at our appendix at page 10. Even assuming for argument's sake that the February 19th, 2019 complaint that was filed by Mr. Reed was the active complaint upon which this case arises. It is, and it's the October 13th, 2020. But even giving the plaintiff every benefit of the doubt, he missed a 63-day time period. Mm -hmm. That 63 days expired on January 31st, 2019. The statute 700.3804 uses the mandatory word shall, the court has no discretion where the plaintiff did not seek an extension of that time. Uh, there is uh, plenty of case law to that effect, as is cited in our brief. Um, to the extent that the court wishes to look beyond the jurisdictional issues, there is no genuine issue of material fact that all of the claims that were brought in the October 13th, 2020 claim are untimely. Uh, I. We tried very hard to be very thorough in our brief. So unless the court has any uh, questions. Perfectly satisfied. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And we ask that the court affirm. Okay, appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you for uh, coming along. Hope you uh, got something out of it today. Good luck to you. <laughs> All righty, that case will be submitted. I'm going to just call the next case since no one's endorsed on it. And that would be or will be to uh, case number 366579 in Ray Quintana minors. I have no one endorsed, and so we're going to go ahead and submit that. And, and there's a companion. I'm sorry, there's a companion case there too. Oh, and there's somebody endorsed on that one. Oh, there we go. Yep, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. right? So, but there's a somebody's endorsed on this other one, uh, Mr. Peltier, but. No, Mr. Peltier. So maybe I'm premature calling that one. Uh, so we'll go ahead and go back to number eight, which is your case. Uh, both sides are ready, correct? Okay. Case number 363041, Semco Inc. versus General Motors. Good morning, Your Honors. Uh, I'd like to reserve a few minutes for rebuttal if I can. 
Thank you for your time this morning. Who do, uh, who do we have? Uh, I'm Daniel Rabbits on behalf of uh, Appellant Semka. Right. And uh, on the television there, who is? Not sure. Where are who are you? What case are you here on, counsel? He's, he's on the Quintana Matter. Oh, you're, you're on, the Quintana? Uh, on the Quintana, Quintana Matter, Your Honor. Oh, I didn't see you there. Uh, do you mind if we take this other case? Uh, and Sure, Your Honor, go ahead. You're waiting. Go ahead. Sorry about that. I didn't see you. Otherwise, you'd... Well, I mean, are, do you have argument or are you, are you going to rush in a brief? Because I can call the case right now. I'm not trying to put pressure on you, but... Uh... Uh, I, I don't want to put any pressure on the court. I, I uh, More than anything, I was just here for if the court had any questions. If that's um, it, and I again, you're entitled to argument, but if if uh, if you're just here for questions, I can call that case right now, and I don't believe the court has any questions, but if you wanted to argue, since I've called this other one, I, I would just go ahead and let them argue. Otherwise, I can call your case, and we'll just submit it on briefs and go with that, if that's easier for you. That, so that's, you. Fine, Your Honor. that's fine, Your Honor. I think it's pretty clear in my brief, so I, I'll leave it at that. Uh, Chad, Belter, I'm, I'm Chad Belter, for the record, on behalf of Mr. Quintana. Okay, I will officially call it then. It's 366-579, in Ray Quintana, minors. No one's endorsed on that one. But on your case, uh, Mr. Peltier, it's 366-580, in Ray Quintana, minors. You are here for your appearance. We are happy with your briefs, and uh, the court has no questions. Uh, so if, if that's good by you, we'll submit it and have something out to you. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank your you. patience. Thank you very much. Case will be submitted. Have a good day. Thank you. All right. So we're back to 360041 Semco versus the uh, versus uh, General Motors and we're ready to go. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I will do my best to stay away from what's already stated in the briefs. Uh, I gleaned the house rules from well from no watching. it's just it's just easier for everybody and there's no use to repeat what you've already written I mean if you know your case and you're happy with it and you, you feel strong about it uh it almost there's if you if people are rereading their briefs sometimes I get the feeling they're not really as sure of themselves as they want to be and I'm sure you are so I mean just bring to attention our attention anything that you think that uh, is really really something to focus on but not necessarily the dispositive thing Absolutely. If um, anything. Of course, Your Honor. Okay. Um, I'd just like to start very briefly on the scope of the appeal. Uh, General Motors says a few times in its brief, Semco relinquished or gave up some part of a breach or its damages. That's not correct. The central question here is a first order question. Is there a contract? Does the statute of frauds apply? Is there consideration for that contract? We believe the answer to all of those questions is in Semco's favor. But at the end of the day, if there's a contract, then we'd like to seek recovery for all the damages, all the consequential damages of all of the breaches. Um, General Motors focused on two contract offenses in its brief. Uh, well, mentioned. are you replying or are you advocating at this point? I mean, I understand that you were, it's advocating, but I mean, uh, uh, Tell us why you should win instead of, I mean, I, I mean, you, you're doing it the right way. No, no problem there, but uh, it's like, this is not rebuttal. So like you get that sure. a rebuttal. So just be a little more advocate your position and then let's see what the other side has to say instead of like anticipating everything they're going to say, unless that's the way you want to do your argument. Understood. It's your up honor. to you. Um, well, I do want to focus a little bit on a statute of frauds okay. response here. Okay. Um, now the, text of the statute of frauds is really central to the defense here. The circuit court and General Motors put in it the three words in the statute, R to B. And the question is whether the circuit court was correct when it found that R to B means that the specially manufactured goods exception to the UCC statute of frauds only points to contracts that go into the future, goods that have not been produced yet. I'd like to point out two things in the statute in the UCC. I don't think quite come across in the briefs. Uh, first is in the specially manufactured goods uh, text itself. When you say doesn't come, doesn't quite come across in the briefs, it means it wasn't raised. It, I think, if it wasn't there, raised, then you don't want to argue it, do you? I think there's one point that I do need to to, okay, to raise, so we can fine tune this. Okay. Yes, Your Honor, because I think it's important because I think it actually could be a palpable error that goes to the entire statute of sure, frauds sure. and the UCC. Um, 
In fact, I'll just go to that bigger issue first. Uh, the parties focus primarily in the circuit court as well on 2201, which is where the statute of frauds is. Just appropriate, but I think there was a step that was missed. The 2201-1 is the uh, general rule for the statute of frauds. R2B was the load-bearing word to the circuit court, or words. It's not the proper word. Proper word is contract, which is actually a defined term in the UCC. UCC, and I have a copy of it here if it's useful for the court, 2106, of of okay. 440-2106, one, defining contract and agreement and contract for sale. In this article, unless the context otherwise requires contract and agreement are limited to those relating to the present or future sale of goods. If you look at 22011, it says, except as otherwise provided in this section, a contract for the sale of goods for the price of $1,000 or more is not enforceable by way of action or defense unless there is a writing sufficient to indicate that a contract for sale has been made. All right, so why should you win? We should win because this is not a contract as given by General Motors under UCC 21061. Uh, if it's not a contract under 21061, that doesn't fit the statute of frauds. It doesn't fit the statute of frauds. It doesn't need to be in writing. Uh, that was the basis of the circuit court's ruling. Uh, General Motors has pressed a consideration argument that was also pressed below. Uh, but, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about that, but I think that's covered by the briefs. Um, there are- You may have more to say in rebuttal, uh, you know. Yes, I, I- You I, could I, save your time for if you choose. I agree, Your Honor. Um, you know, I, I think for the most part, our arguments are found in the briefs uh, and, uh, you know, I would just like to press that in the event that this court rules that the per partial performance uh, exception or and the specially manufactured goods exception more particularly to the UCC statute of frauds only applies in the event where you have a good contract that goes into the future. It would essentially be importing an entirely new category of contracts into the UCC okay. statute of frauds. Uh, and I'll reserve for remainder of my time. Plenty of time. Thank you so much. Good morning, Your Honors. Good morning. John Rhodes on behalf of General Motors LLC. Uh, I'd like to start <clears throat> just by responding to the reply and also to what was just said um, with regards to the forfeiture of arguments below. Um, Semco argues in its reply brief that it did not forfeit arguments related to the partial performance exception to the statute of frauds. Yes. But the cases it cites uh, don't really support that proposition and are distinguishable because in those cases, <clears throat> the plaintiffs, and I'm uh, referring specifically to the Stewart case, for example, did in fact make an argument in the trial court that preserved an issue for appeal. In that case, the plaintiffs preserved a quiet title claim because they asserted an absolute equitable title argument to the circuit court and cited a case that directly addressed that issue. So an argument was made by a plaintiff and it was preserved and then more fully made to the appellate court. Here, no argument was made by Semco based on part performance in the trial court. That argument was clearly forfeited and should not be considered by this court, GM didn't have a chance to respond to it. Semco could have raised that argument in response to GM's motion for summary disposition. It didn't. It could have raised it at oral argument. It didn't. It could have raised it in its motion for reconsideration. It didn't. It raises it for the first time in its appellate brief. So that argument, uh, the part performance, that the part performance exception to the statute of frauds applies is clearly waived or forfeited. <clears throat> um, with regard to Semco's uh, argument that was, again, just stated for the very first time, not in the briefs, uh, that uh, the so-called oral agreement that's at issue here is not really a contract under the UCC. That argument 
was never made in the trial court or in the briefs and was therefore not preserved and, and should not be considered. If it is, it contradicts Semco's whole theory of the case. Their, their, their amended complaint alleges that a March 2018 oral agreement is the contract that they're suing on. So our response to that, obviously, is it's not enforceable under the statute of frauds. Um, if they're trying to make a wholesale change to their pleading at this stage, that's, that's too late, it's improper, it wasn't preserved, it wasn't alleged, it wasn't argued in the trial court or here. Um, so, so that argument should also be rejected. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to just briefly touch on a couple other points. I'll pause there in case there are any questions on those issues. So uh, I just wanna remind the court that this is a quintessential statute of frauds case. There's an allegation that there's an oral agreement uh, to uh, pay for goods. It's undisputed that this falls within the UCC and that the statute of frauds applies. This is in fact Semco's second attempt to evade the statute of limitations. The goods we're talking about here were sold 10 to 15 years ago. So we're talking, the, the goods that are at issue were sold to GM in 2009 to 2014. So in its first complaint, Semco alleged the quote unquote contractual documents were breached by GM. Upon realizing that that claim was barred by a four year statute of limitations, uh, it pivoted to its new argument. And in, in the original complaint, it alleged- right, we, we, yeah. we know all that. Okay. But <clears throat> so why should you prevail here? We should prevail because this is exactly the type of case that the statute of frauds is intended to protect against. A, a nebulous evolving oral agreement that is constantly uh, subject to interpretation, what the terms of it are, are unknown because it's not in writing. And the UCC is intended to encourage parties to reduce their agreements to writing for a reason. Um, this is exactly what the statute of frauds is intended to protect against is fraud and perjury to protect the party uh, from this type of situation where there's an argument for additional payment on goods that were sold 10 to 15 years ago. And if the statute of frauds is not enforced here, there's nothing to prevent Semco from arguing that they should go even farther back in time and the GM should pay more for goods from back sold in 2004 or the 1990s. I, I mean, the oral agreement that Semco is alleging is one belied by all the documents, um, but it, and, and that underscores why the statute of frauds needs to be applied uh, in this case. Any other questions? I don't know. Yeah. It's good. Much. Our, our quiet doesn't mean anything's wrong. Okay, thank you. It means that you maybe you're better than you thought. <laughs> uh, Hello again, your honors. Uh, just a few points in rebuttal. Um, first on preservation, uh, I acknowledge that the uh, summary disposition response below doesn't focus or really focus at all on the partial performance argument. However, General Motors stated that it did not have a chance to respond to that argument. And I think that's pretty clearly belied by the part, uh, briefs below because General Motors came out and pre-budded that argument. It's in their summary disposition briefing. Um, on 2106. But does that save you? Is that what you're suggesting? I'm suggesting that the, the purpose of the preservation argument to allow the court below to consider the argument and to allow opposing counsel and the opposing party to have a chance to respond to that argument is satisfied here. And I think that uh, it would be appropriate in this court case for this court to consider the argument on appeal, Your Honor. Um, on 2106, again, I acknowledge that this argument was not raised in the briefs below. But I do think it's important for this court to consider it because I do believe this is an issue of first impression, with the application of the specially manufactured goods uh, exception to the UCC statute of frauds in the state. Um, I don't believe either party was able to find any authority uh, considering this exception in this instance. And the possibility of accidentally 
uh, importing this new category of contracts, which is essentially a contract to resolve a past dispute that also incorporates a business decision to continue our relationship going forward uh, could be included under the UCC statute of frauds, something that the legislature's inclusion of the word contract, which is defined by 2106 and then appears in 2201, uh, shows that the legislature did not intend this category of contracts to be under the UCC statute of frauds at all. Um, I'd also like to reiterate and I think this is in our briefs, that there were two months of performance under this contract by SEMCO, this March oral agreement. Uh, General Motors did put forward several things about uh, the briefing or the pleadings and when uh, SEMCO first asserted the existence of the oral agreement and uh, the possibility that SEMCO in the future could say, actually, the agreement went back before 2009. That's all things for cross-examination at a trial. It's not appropriate for decision on summary disposition. Um, you, Semco affirmatively had a witness testify, the prime witness, Mr. Cornley, uh, to the oral agreement that the agreement only went back to 2009 and even stated that there were claims that went back earlier into the 1990s, but gave those up. Uh, um, this is rebuttal, remember? Yes, yes, Your Honor. Um, la last thing I just want to focus on um, the assertion that uh, the existence of the oral agreement is belied by all the documents. I don't think that's correct. Um, General Motors has made that point, made that point in oral argument a moment ago. Uh, General Motors paid an invoice that was submitted by Semco on May 29th, it paid that invoice in July. That's after the oral agreement, it's after the written agreement. And in December, General Motors identified that as being for the uh, payments that were missed or that were underpaid in an email. Um, that's an objective manifestation that General Motors was still complying with the terms of the March oral agreement. There's nothing in the written agreement that says General Motors has to pay that invoice. My understanding is that General Motors doesn't typically pay $400,000 out of right. it. So, so, yeah. um, with that, Your Honor, unless there's any questions. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Did a good job, both of you. Thank you, so you Your Honor. appreciate it very much. Thank that you. case will be submitted. Um, That's a right. You called a letter. He, he did. He called a letter. Yeah, so what about 12 and 13? Huh? Okay, it's tomorrow. It's tomorrow. Okay. Uh, anybody in here for any particular reason to do with the court? No? Okay. Right. This is Alex Pedraza, who is an extern in my office. So you are here. Oh, You've okay. got something to do. Well, anyway, let's yeah. let's close up here officially uh, so we can get off YouTube. Uh, we will, uh, that concludes today's call, and uh, we are adjourned until tomorrow.